We can get started now. Um, welcome to your neighbor, the alligator. My name is Erin Moran, and I'm the public programs intern for UGA Marine Extension and Georgia Sea Grant. As an organization, we conduct research, education, and outreach for healthy coastal ecosystems and communities. Today, we have Isaac Murphy, who is one of our marine education fellows here, and he'll be educating us about one of the largest reptiles in the world and how coexistence with these animals is so important to preserving the health of our coastal ecosystems. Uh, just a few Zoom tips before we get started. Your video and microphone are off because we are on webinar, but if you have questions, feel free to type in the Q&A box or the chat box. Depending on your device, the chat box and the Q&A box are either on the top or bottom of your screen. Um, I'll share those questions with Isaac at the end of his program. Um, and with that being said, I'm gonna turn it over to Isaac to get started. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Erin. Like she said, my name is Isaac. I'm a UGA Education Fellow here at the UGA Education Center and Aquarium, and welcome to your neighbor, the alligator. An hour-long gator palooza, we're going to learn all about one of my absolute favorite animals, why they're so cool, why they're so important, and how we can all be good neighbors to our alligators. And with that, let's get started. So first, we got to meet our neighbors, the American alligator. They are an aquatic reptile, which means they're gonna be spending most of their time in the water and they're perfectly adapted for that. Then being reptiles, they're gonna have all of the major characteristics of reptiles. They're gonna have a vertebrate or a backbone. They're gonna have scaly skin. They're gonna lay eggs on land and they're going to be uh, ectothermic or cold blooded, which means they're gonna regulate their temperature from things outside their body versus inside their body. They're also carnivores. They're gonna be meat eaters and their diet ranges from uh, small bugs and stuff to when they're hatchlings up to things the size of like an adult deer uh, when they're fully grown. One key thing though I wanna point out is we're definitely not on their menu. Um, alligators actually have a natural fear of humans, um, but we're gonna to get to a little bit later um, how that may not be the case with some individuals. And their size, um, they start off hatchlings are about maybe nine centimeters, so teeny, teeny, tiny, uh, but they can grow up to sizes of about 14 feet long and weigh over a thousand pounds. So they can get to be just absolutely massive. Males can be a little bit bigger than females, uh, but not by much. And you can see their range in this map on the bottom left, it's all across the southeastern United States in the watersheds of that area. And they can tolerate such a wide uh, range of temperatures and climate because there are very hardy animals, very well adapted uh, for the environments that they live in. But they are what we call living fossils. So they have ancient ancestors. The order Crocodilia actually originated around 250 million years ago. And the order Crocodilia is where all the crocodilians, including alligators, belong to nowadays. Specifically, the alligator section of Crocodilia has an ancestor called Dinosuchus, translates to terrible crocodile. This absolute monster was up to 39 feet long, which is as long as a school bus. And if you look at the picture on the right there, you can see they could take down things even as large as a T-Rex or any medium-sized dinosaur that was unfortunate enough to venture to the water's edge. And the Dinosuchus was uh, in the late Cretaceous era, so 83 to 72 million years ago. And uh, crocodilians today haven't really changed that much. They're obviously not 39 feet long, um, but their body plan and adaptations are pretty much the same, which is why we refer to them as living fossils. And I know you mentioned uh, alligators are our neighbors, but we are moving into their neighborhood. Uh, they're not moving into ours since they have been around for a long time. And that's why we wanna be good neighbors because we're moving in, we wanna put our best foot forward. Next slide. I know we're gonna focus on the American uh, alligator today, but I just wanted to mention that they have cousins all around the world. There is another type of alligator out there, the Chinese alligators it's found in China. Um, crocodiles, they're distinguished by their V-shaped snout versus an alligator's kind of U-shaped snout. You can see on the left here, that is a saltwater crocodile. Those are found in Australia. 
They're the largest of the crocodilians, can be up to 20 feet long, so just massive animals. Cayman are another type of crocodilian. Um, this one on the bottom right here is called a yaquer caiman. It's found in Brazil and the watersheds of the Amazon River. And caiman are kind of distinguished because they got gnarly teeth. They got teeth going every which way direction. So that's one of the characteristics. Usually you can tell a caiman from a crocodile or an alligator. And then finally, the gharials, most distinct ones. This one on the right is an Indian gharial. And they have that very specialized uh, mouth that's used for spearing fish uh, out of the water. Um, so their mouth is, is specialized for their hunting strategy. Strategy. It's a little bit different um, from the other crocodilians. Mm. Getting back to the American alligator, we're going to touch a little bit about the family life of your neighbors. So alligator moms are some of the best in the reptile world. They offer a level of maternal care that is very unique among reptiles. In fact, recent research has found that uh, maternal care can last for up to three years, which is absolutely unheard of amongst other reptiles. You can see when they're born, they're itty bitty bitty. Um, this picture on the left is showing you a fresh hatchling. And they have a lot to worry about when they're hatchling because a lot of predators like large birds, raccoons, snakes, um, things like that, love to eat baby alligators. Um, so the mom has to be on her guard. Now the eggs are laid and incubated for about 60 to 90 days in a nest like the one on the picture in the right. Um, the mom will make this a nest, uh, lay her eggs and then cover the eggs with vegetation to allow them to incubate and eventually hatch. And once they do hatch, uh, the mom takes her, them to a nursery area that she's kind of sectioned off, usually away from the main kind of waterway so that they're a little bit more protected and she can keep an eye on them a little bit better. And you can see all the babies are hanging out on mom, are nice and protected in this picture on the right. But I have a few videos to show y'all of just an example of how amazing these moms are. So let's take a look and let's watch closely What's going on in this mom alligator's mouth? So let me see if I can pause it. So not only does she have an egg in her mouth, but you can see the little thing moving right there. See a little baby alligator and don't freak out. She's not gonna eat it. That's actually how they carry the babies to and from the nest. And they also use their mouth to gently crack open any eggs that didn't quite make it out, which just blows my mind because American alligators have the third strongest bite force going down in the entire animal kingdom, over 2000 pounds per square inch, which is like the weight of a small car on a space like that big. So just immense force uh, that's possible and the fact that they can be so gentle with such strong jaws absolutely blows my mind because they can crack the egg very gently and uh, help that little baby uh, get out of its egg if it needs any help. And also can carry them um, to where they need to go. Now the moms do keep a watchful eye on the young. In this next video, we're gonna see what happens. So let me set the stage a little bit. Up in the, the top middle, you can see a blue heron. And these herons are a big predator of baby alligators. And it's poking around this nest. And let's, uh, let's check out, see what happens when mom spies the predator. So yes, the mom was not too happy about that. Um, and she protects the nest fiercely. She has that great maternal instinct and keeps predators away um, to the best of her ability. Next slide. Now you wouldn't think of alligators making noise, but they actually can be pretty noisy neighbors. We're gonna talk about two types of vocalizations. The first is called bellowing, it's used for mating displays by males to claim territory, assert dominance, pretty much say like, oh, I'm big and mean and I'm here, trying to impress the ladies and uh, scare away the other potential mates. And that's what's going on in this bottom uh, picture right here. 
And the bellowing is at such a low frequency that it actually vibrates the water on top of the alligator's back. And you can see the water's kind of, uh, kind of mid vibrating right there. It's called a water dance. And it's because of that such low frequency of bellowing. There's also juvenile vocalizations. And these are when an alligator is young, they have to communicate with the mom somehow. Um, and they kind of make this chirping sound. And we're gonna look at examples of each of these. So first we're gonna look at dad saying hello. They can make a hissing noise and they can also make this bellowing. Now this one is not that loud. So turn up your speakers a bunch to make sure you can hear this one. Oh, so I can't have it. Let's play it again. Sounds like Jurassic Park, honestly. Don't know what I would do if I heard that in the wild. I would be a little nervous. All right, next, let's listen to those juvenile vocalizations. They're going to make that sound to signal to mom where they are, signal to mom maybe something's not okay for a variety of reasons. And here, um, this one's a little bit softer too, so make sure your volume's turned up. This is like a chorus of them all going off and you'll be able to spy the gator hole, the nest on where the mom is living. See all the babies there. So yeah. Let me play that one, one more time. All right. Next slide. So before we talk about their home sweet home, I've talked about these guys enough. Now it's time to meet one in person. And while we're transitioning cameras, um, we're going to put up our first poll. Um, so I'm going to see if you're listening. And we're going to test your knowledge, put up this poll, and we'll transition real quick. All right. I'm going to launch our first poll. So the question is, how big do you think an American alligator can get? Your choices are 10 feet long, 23 feet long, 5 feet long, or 14 feet long. I'll give you a few Seconds to answer that. See a lot of answers coming in. We're gonna give it like 15 more seconds. All right, five more seconds just to get the last few in. Let's see if we can get everyone's answers. All right, so the majority of people said 14 feet long. Excellent, y'all were listening. Um, so the maximum length for these guys is about 14 feet long. Um, but my friend Squiggles here obviously is not 14 feet long. And he's a lot smaller than that. And we're gonna go down its body and talk about the amazing adaptation um, that these guys have in order to uh, live their lives. So first, we're going to start off at the very, oh, exit this real quick so I can see what I'm doing. There we go. We're going to start at the very, very tip of its head. And we're going to talk about the placement of three important organs, its nose, its eyes, and its ears. So it's not the middle of the head of yours, its eyes are right here, and the ears are right here right behind its eyes, these little kind of slits. And those are all three on the very top of their head. And that's important because that means they can submerge up to 96% of their body and just keep those three things above the water to see what's on the water's edge. This makes them an excellent ambush predator. So if you've never seen an alligator hunting, what they're gonna do 
They're going to stick all their body um, under the water, except for those three things, the eyes, the nose, and the ears. And they're going to wait very, very patiently for something to come uh, to the water's edge and then snap it really, really quick um, with speeds up to 20 or 35 miles an hour. They can leap out of the water and grab their uh, unsuspecting prey. They also have these black dots all along their mouth. You can kind of see, yeah, it's focusing real good there. So these black dots kind of right here, those are called integumentary organs. Those are pressure sensing organs uh, that can detect the changes in water pressure. And so they know the second that something breaks the surface of the water, if anything also falls in the water, they are immediately aware of it. Also can't forget about these teeth. So yes, alligators are born with teeth and similar to a shark, they can regrow teeth, but unlike a shark, the new teeth actually grow above the old ones and they can go through up to 3000 teeth in one lifetime. And they use those teeth for uh, ripping and tearing um, their prey because they can't chew. So they have to swallow everything whole. So they use those teeth to rip uh, apart their prey and also use the characteristic death roll, which I'm sure you're familiar with, um, to rip apart their prey so they can swallow it in nice bite-sized chunks. You can see this one still has its stripes and the stripes are specific just to juveniles. So they have this as a kind of a form of camouflage uh, to help, better, uh, help them better blend in. Um, Cause like we talked about, a lot of predators go after these guys when they're smaller, including other adult male alligators. And so that's the biggest thing I actually have to worry about is other male alligators when they're this size. Uh, but he's about to grow out of his stripes. And once they get to be about, say, about six, five, six feet long, nothing is going to be able to tango with them. They're going to be what we call an apex predator, which means they're going to be on the very top of the food chain. One reason why they are an apex predator are these things on its back. So these are what's called osteoderms. So osteoderm, let's break that word down. Osteo means bone, derm means skin. So it literally translates to bone skin. That's exactly what these things are. They're little bony plates that are embedded into the skin. And they function as armor and protect it from anything that could potentially try to, uh, to attack it or go for it. Also talk about the tail. So get a good look at the, the body plan here. You can see this tail is almost half the body length. It's uh, composed of what's called laterally compressed muscle. And this strong muscular tail is what they use for swimming. They don't use their legs. They're not gonna doggy pedal. They're gonna swing this tail back and forth and they can reach speeds of up to 20 miles an hour. Uh, in the in the water and can lunge out of the water at that speed as well. So very effective swimmers. They do have webbed feet. So you get a look at those feet right there. You can see the bottom ones too. Yeah, there you go. They have webbed feet to help better, you know, get around in the water to orient themselves, um, but not used for swimming, just used for for orienting themselves in the water and also for going on land. Now they can run fairly fast on land in small doses. So a common kind of thing you're told is to run in a zigzag if you're being chased by an alligator. Don't do that. You're just going to look really stupid. <laughs> so definitely don't do that um, because they can actually run about 10 miles an hour-ish in short bursts. So your best bet is just to hightail it out of there as quick as you can. But like we talked about earlier, they have an innate fear of humans. They're not going to be running after you. They're going to be running away from you more than likely. One final adaptation that they have that I want to point out, I want to see if he can demonstrate it for us. So I'm going to see if he wants to play the game for you. Okay. All right, so when I remove my hand, I want you to watch his eyes very carefully. I see now he's being stubborn. Oh, see that? I'll do it again. Do -do -do. Yeah, so there's a third one that they possess it's called a nictitating membrane. It moves from side to side across the eye. 
and it functions as a pair of built-in goggles they use um, they pass over their eye to help them better see when they're underwater which would be really nice if we had a pair of built-in goggles so these things have so many cool adaptations they're amazing animals but i want to open the floor up for questions that anyone may have about squiggles here or american alligators so aaron do we have any questions Yes, we do. So the first question is, where did Squiggles come from and how, why do you have him? Yes, excellent question. And that's actually a point I forgot to bring up. So Squiggles uh, was a rescue from the wild. So her mom was, became something that we call a nuisance gator that we're going to talk all about later. And she had to end up being, uh, had to end up being relocated. And the babies uh, were then given to different facilities and we got two of them. So this is Squiggles and Stripes is the other one. And we take them in as ambassador animals. So we have a permit from DNR to house these and show them to the public so we can teach everyone about how important alligators are because normally you would not want to be doing this in the wild. In fact, it's actually illegal to do this in the wild. Um, so we're special since we're under that permit and we're allowed to have these ambassador animals. Great question. All right. Anymore? The next question is, since alligators are temperature, they're temperature dependent, um, their sex with global climate change happening, do scientists anticipate one gender of alligators showing up more than another? Yes, that's an excellent question. Um, that is a big concern, not with just alligators, but with sea turtles as well. Um, so the way that uh, alligators work on the low end of the temperature scale, it's female. And then there's a sweet spot in the middle where it's male and female. So that is, there is potential that if temperatures increase enough, it will have an all female population of American alligators, which is obviously unsustainable. So it is a big concern, not only with American alligators, um, but with a lot of other reptiles that have temperature dependent sexes during incubation. Great question. All right, some more specific ones to Squiggles. Um, when someone asks, how unhappy is he, is he do for you holding him right now? Oh, no, he's definitely not unhappy. Um, you, could, you could see he let me put my hand over his head. Um, if he did not want to be held, trust me, he would be wiggling everywhere and would not let me uh, be holding him. Um, they actually like being held, um, or at least they are a fan of it because, like we talked about, they're ectothermic. So my arm is like a huge space heater. Um, so it's warming him up and he's getting some nice body heat for me. So you can see he's nice and chillaxed. Um, he's nice and relaxed. He's thermoregulating with his mouth open. So that's what that mouth open means. He's letting me hold him. You can see his legs are nice and limp. So he is relaxing. I appreciate your concern though for him. All right. Is it true that male alligators can eat their own young as well as other young gators? Yes, that is absolutely true, um, which is why the mom does not stick around with the dad. Um, they go through the mating process and then the male kind of just goes on uh, their way. And then the mom tends to the young and to the nest. So, yes, that is absolutely true. All right. Another question is, if needed... Could a human outrun an alligator? Yes, definitely could. I mean, you have to be, you know, you know, in good shape. You need, you need to be able to run pretty fast too. But you could outrun one um, if you wanted to. Plus, the likelihood of a gator chasing you is very slim to none. Um, we're going to talk about maybe some reasons that'll be um, later on. All right, this is an interesting one. Uh, can an alligator mate with a crocodile? I'm sure. Not successfully. So they are two different species. Um, so they would not produce viable offspring. Um, but in terms of it happening, it could potentially happen maybe in the southern tip of Florida where there are alligators and crocodiles in the same spot. In fact, it's the only spot in the world where that happens. Um, so not saying it's never happened before, but there would be no viable offspring. So no babies being made. Interesting question. Yeah. Okay, so can you describe what squiggles, squiggles skin feels like? Is it scaly or slimy? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, 
it's actually pretty soft. Um, alligators were hunted for their leather. So that's a prized commodity and it, it does not feel how you think it would. It's kind of soft. Um, it's not slimy at all. And uh, one fun thing that our aquarist here just absolutely loves and I love too is feeling their little feet because um, they feel so soft and so squishy. Um, so yeah, the very unique, uh, unique feeling, um, unique sensation. Um, if you want to you want to feel an alligator yourself, I would recommend going to an aquarium or a wildlife center or somewhere like that where they have ambassador animals for you to interact with. Um, like we talked about, definitely don't do this in the wild. All right, I think for now, that's going to be all the questions we answer um, if we want to transition. Yeah, sounds good to me. Everyone say goodbye to Squiggles. He did an excellent job. We're going to put him back in his little home and we're going to transition um, by doing another poll and seeing how well you were listening when I was talking about these adaptations. All right, let me pull up the next poll. So this question is, which features help an alligator live in an aquatic environment? A uh, third eyelid that functions as placement of their eyes, ears, and nose on top of their head, or all of the above. I'll just give you a few seconds to answer while Isaac is transitioning. All right, like five more seconds before I close it up. All right, everyone said all of the above. Yay, y'all were listening. Ah, love to see it. All right, so we're gonna resume our presentation. Let me share my screen real quick. We we'll talk about why these alligators are and the jobs they do in the ecosystem. So we're gonna talk about all about home sweet home or in the gator world, we call them gator holes. So alligators uh, make their own homes. And since they are aquatic, they do constantly need a source of water around them. So they make their own source of water. You can see this picture on the bottom right. They're gonna dig this hole in the ground with their strong tails and their strong bodies. The bigger the alligator, bigger the hole. And during drought season, when the water level decreases, the gator holes are the only place that has water. You see on the left here, here's a picture from the Everglades, a gator hole in the middle there. And these uh, one on the top right, all these alligators hanging out in a gator hole. And this is important, not just for the alligators, but for the entire ecosystem. So fresh water is important for all terrestri terrestrial animals because they need a source of fresh water to drink. A lot of times gator holes are the only sources during a drought. So terrestrial animals rely on these gator holes as a source of fresh drinking water. Um, fish rely on these gator holes as a place to live during a drought. So that's the only place they can go where there's water. And they kind of cohabitate with the alligators in these gator holes. And if there were no gator holes, uh, the fish would have nowhere to go during a drought. So these uh, homemade homes are very important, not only to alligators, but to the surrounding ecosystems. And you can see this one on the, the left here, this gator has made himself a gator hole. So you can see he's mud tracks from where he slid in there and made his depression where the water can collect uh, under the, the, uh, the surface of the groundwater. And you can see he's peeking out and just barely displaying those uh, adaptations. So only his eyes, nose and ears are peeking out and looking to see if anyone wants to come investigate his gator hole. Now, because of the important jobs the American alligator has, not only uh, forming those gator holes, being uh, ecological engineers, also being apex predators. That's an important role too. They're what we call a keystone species. Now, let's learn all about what that means. But first, I'm gonna ask y'all if you already know what it means. So we're just gonna test your knowledge real quick. Don't feel bad if you don't know. Like I said, we're gonna go all over it 
um, in this next activity. So we're going to transition again. Zoom off. All right, so for this poll, the question is, what does it mean to be a keystone species? And the choices are an organism is at the top of the food chain, an organism is at the bottom of the food chain, an entire ecosystem depends on an organism, or a species is endangered. Give you a few seconds. We'll just give you a few more seconds to answer. And Isaac, are you going to um, stop sharing your screen? Yes, I will do that. Thank you. Perfect. <laughs> All right. So we had a mixture of answers, but uh, the majority of people said an entire ecosystem depends on an organism. Yes, the majority of you got it right, but for anyone that didn't get it right, no worries. We're going to go over. Um, why all those answers are kind of wrong because some of them are all of them are partially right but the the one where they depend on the entire ecosystem is the most right so can a keystone species be at the top of the food chain yes the american alligator is a perfect example it's not a uh, fast and true rule can they be at the bottom of the food chain yes they can um so they, even the things at the bottom of the food chain can be the keystone can be the foundation of an ecosystem but it's not always true. Can keystone species be endangered? Of course they can. In fact, most of them are, sadly enough. Um, but that's not always true as well. So the definition of a keystone species is an organism that an entire ecosystem depends on. And we're going to do a demonstration on what that looks like. So the word keystone actually comes from architecture. It refers to this part of an arch. So this stone right here is the middle. It's called the keystone. And it holds the whole thing together. If this uh, stone was removed, the two sides would come collapsing down. It would just be madness, pandemonium. Obviously, we don't want that. So we're going to do a demonstration where we are going to set up an ecosystem on this arch. Starting with star of the show, or American alligator. We're going to put him on the top. Next. And these waiting birds, storks, herons, ibises, things like that. These things are important. We're going to put them up here too. Next, these dastardly fellas, raccoons. Uh, they're important parts of a swamp and wetland ecosystem. We're going to put them up here on the board. Grasses can't have a wetland or a marsh without grass. These things are real important. I'm going to put them right here. Fish. Got fish in the water. Fish are going to go on the board as well. Fish here. We got snails that live on the grass. They're important as well. Put them right here. And then last, got some water bugs that live in the water. They eat stuff in the water. They're important. Put them right here. All right, so we've got our ecosystem here. Now let's go through a little exercise and see what happens when the American alligator disappears. So let's say for whatever reason, alligator leaves, um, packs up shop, it's no longer there anymore. So he's gone. Whoop. He's out of here. The whole middle section is gone. So no more American alligator, no more gator holes. Let's say a drought comes around. Um, where are the fish going to go? They're not going to go anywhere. There's nowhere to go. The water is all going to dry up. No more fish. Bye-bye fish. Yeah. 
So next, talk about the storks. So the storks are going to eat some of the fish. Uh, if there's not a food supply, they're just going to fly away and go somewhere else. So no more storks. Oh, this isn't looking too good. All right, no more gator holes means no more sources of fresh water during drought for terrestrial animals like raccoon. So that means no more raccoon. Uh oh, this is just, this is madness. This isn't an ecosystem at all. We're going to keep going. So raccoons love to eat snails. So no more. No more raccoons means a lot more snails. Drop a little snail. Such a good artist. Same thing for bugs as well. So the fish keep the bug populations in check. Without the fish, the bugs are going to go crazy. And then these snails and these bugs are going to go crazy on this grass. So the grass is not going to be allowed to grow well enough without being eaten by those insects. So no more grass. And then once they've eaten all of the grass, no more snails and no more bugs. So you can see the domino effect that happens when you remove a keystone species from its intended ecosystem. It's just a cascade down the line, just ruins everything. Because so many things are dependent on that one organism. Right. So that is why American alligators are so important and we need to be good neighbors to them because they need to do their important jobs um, along the coasts and in the barrier island habitats where they supply that fresh water source to all these animals. So next we're gonna transition back to the presentation um, with our next poll and talk about how you can be good neighbors to your alligators. All right, for this poll, true or false, humans have an impact on alligator populations. So true or false. Just give it a few more seconds, just so we can have Isaac up here. And I'm gonna end it. Everyone said true. Good job. So that is definitely the correct answer. So we actually have a bit of a complicated history with the American alligator. We didn't used to be good neighbors. In fact, they were at one point at risk of going extinct due to human action. Um, they were hunted for their meat and their leather. They were way overhunted. The populations were not looking too great here um, in the southeastern U.S. However, in 1967, the American alligator was listed as federally protected in an act that actually came before the Endangered Species Act of 1973. So they were like the hipsters of endangered species. They were endangered before it was cool. I um, mean, the successful efforts of hunting organizations, state wildlife federations, and a federal wildlife um, uh, organizations as well, uh, banded together. And in 1987, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife declared the American alligator populations fully recovered. And now they enjoy a healthy and robust population all along the southeastern U.S. But they still face problems today, mainly due to their reputation and continued human interaction, which can affect them in a negative way. This term nuisance gators, I'm gonna define for you is one that is at least four feet in length and keyword and is believed to pose a threat to people, pets and property. Now think about it, four feet, that's not that big. Just to give you some reference, squiggles was about four feet long. So not that big to be considered a nuisance and they have to be um, believed to be a threat, which is something that we can change. But the way a lot of nuisance gators actually come about is due to human interactions. In this next slide, we're going to look at an example. Like I talked about earlier, 
Uh, the American alligators do have an innate fear of humans. We're not on their menu or anything. Um, they're going to most likely, if they see us and the ones that I've seen in the wild, they're either just going to sit there and look at you or they're going to some way be like, oh, get away from me, you gross human. However, uh, once in an expedition, and this is around in September of last year, we were going out to Wausau Island and I spotted a gator as we were going through the marsh. And we stopped the boat to try to get a good look at it. And then this happened. So let's, um, let's play this video and see how this gator is acting. So what happened is when we stopped the boat, gator actually approached us, which is very strange, approached the boat with its mouth open. I don't know if you can see it from the video, but its mouth was open underwater. Now I'm gonna pose this question to y'all in the chat. Why do you think this gator is exhibiting this behavior that is so abnormal? Anyone have any guesses and hypothesis? Fire those away in the chat. Let's see. Oh, I see some people. Humans fed it, human interaction. Maybe you were near the nest. It's used to people feeding it, being fed by humans. The next thing is an interesting hypothesis, um, but there was no nest in the area. And usually the mom would be a lot more kind of showy and it would jump out, it would hiss. It would try to deter us as much as possible. It wouldn't get closer to us it would stay close to its nest. Interesting hypothesis, not quite right. Uh, most of the people though, hit the nail on the head. It has been fed by humans. So it now associates humans with food. That is not an association that we want. You can see, you've probably seen these signs, wherever there are alligators present in like a state park or a place like that, do not feed the alligators. This is why we don't want them becoming accustomed to humans feeding them because that can just lead to not great things. Because when they see humans, they're going to expect to be fed and anything that falls in the water around humans, they're going to automatically think that it's food. Because like we talked about, they can sense the second that something breaks the surface of the water. So a lot of times they won't even hesitate to check something out if it drops in the water near a human, if they've been accustomed to it, they're just going to automatically assume that it's food and then chomp down. And you can see how that would be a little bit problematic. They can't help it. It's just what they're used to. So most important slide of the whole presentation, how to be a good neighbor. Rule number one, never, ever feed an alligator in the wild. Just don't do it. It's not a good sign or it's not a good time and it can lead to nuisance gators and problem alligators. And one thing I will mention is these alligators can travel quite far. Uh, John Crawford imparted some wisdom onto me that they had tagged alligators at Wausau Island and they had tagged them and seen through satellite tags that they swam all the way up to Hilton Head. So I know we have someone tuning in from Hilton Head. So there are gators that can migrate that far and so problem gators and nuisance problem gators and nuisance gators can migrate that far as well. So that's why it's just you never want to feed one because you don't want one being accustomed to this behavior and potentially traveling elsewhere as well and bringing that bad association elsewhere. Number two, respect their space in the wild. Usually this is very simple. Just don't get all up in their business. They're not. They're definitely not going to get up in your business all things are right and they haven't been fed. Um, so you just don't want to harass them at all. I um, mean, it is illegal to interact with them and touch them if you don't have a permit or scientific research or something like that. Just respect their space and they will respect yours as well. Don't swim where you know gators are present. Nine times out of 10, they're not going to bother you at all if you get in the water with them. But you don't know if one of those gators is a nuisance gator, is accustomed to humans and wants food when you're around. So 
it's better just not to chance it, leave their habitat alone, and swim elsewhere where you know gators aren't present. Number four, keep your pets on a leash around potential gator habitats. This is another, another instance you never know if there are any problem gators uh, in that habitat. And if they see human, they're going to think they're going to get food and they can't really tell the difference between your dog and say like a raccoon. We don't want to confuse them. We don't want to give them an option um, to think that your dog is a potential meal. So just keeping them on a leash and next to you when you're around sources of water and potential gator habitats, best practice. Number five, stick up for your neighbor. Uh, alligators get this terrible rap from these bloodthirsty man-eating machines that all they want to do is just <laughs> go around eating people. That is definitely not the case. Like I said, they have an innate fear of humans. They're highly intelligent. Um, they offer an exceptional level of maternal care. They have complex families. Um, so very fascinating, intelligent, and integral uh, species that we need to protect and kind of turn the tide in terms of perception on how they are kind of perceived from the general public because they get a way worse rap uh, than they deserve. And we need them around to do those important jobs like we talked about in being a keystone species. Also, another thing to do is to protect their wetland habitats. So wetlands are rapidly uh, disappearing all across the United States, specifically where American alligators call their homes. So stick our protecting wetland habitats and advocating for that protection is another way to stick up for your neighbor as well. Now we talked about it's not a good idea to interact with an alligator. It's definitely not a good idea to take one home. That's just the worst idea ever. But I luckily designed a craft to uh, help you take an alligator home with you. So let's watch this real quick. I'm going to play. There we go. So yes, um, I designed this craft and you will all get activity sheets that will be sent to your email and did the detailed descriptions of each step on how to make these cute little things. So you're gonna make your own alligator out of recycled materials, and have one to safely take home with you. So be looking out for that activity sheet and it'll be sent your way sometime soon. All right. So before we get into questions, I want to launch um, the last few polls just to see what y'all learned 
um, and see how much y'all were listening. So we can go ahead with the first one. All right, coexistence with our local crocodilians is possible, true or false? Let's see. I'm liking how this is looking so far. All right. Yeah, so of course it's true. We can all be good neighbors to our alligators and we can coexist peacefully. Um, so true is definitely the right answer. All right, so next one. What is something you do not do when you see an alligator in the wild? Do you feed it? Do you get closer? Do you take a cool picture from a safe distance? or both A and B? What do you not do? All right, I'm liking how this is looking too. Give it a few more seconds, get your answers in. All right, yes, so both A and B, you do not feed it, do not get closer, but you can definitely take a cool picture from a safe distance. Excellent, all right, last one. Alligators want to eat people, true or false? Better be 100% on this one. Are so good. Give it a few more seconds. This one should be a landslide, hopefully. All right, yes, of course, false alligators do not want to eat people. Good job. Looks like y'all learned some stuff. And now I'm going to open it up again to any more questions that y'all have. Uh, while we've got some time. So let me look in the chat. Let's see. Any more questions for me? You can put them in the chat or the Q&A. Um, we have a few questions in the Q&A box. Um, so someone asked, uh, what can I do at home to help protect alligators and their habitats? Excellent question. Um, so first off, follow those rules that I gave you, how to be a good neighbor. Um, stick up for them. Um, stick up for wetland habitats. Um, get interested in like alligator research going on. In fact, we do a lot of alligator research here at uh, UJ Marine Extension. Um, so getting brushed up on that, supporting researchers, that are doing um, important work. Um, in fact, I know a researcher here in the Savannah area, her name is Laura Kojima. She is studying alligator ecotoxicology. So looking at levels of toxins in alligator meat to better assess uh, toxins that are potentially present in the waterways. There's a, very, a lot of cool ways that we can study alligators and learn not just about them, but our environment as well. Excellent question. How do they Great. kill their... Oops, sorry, go ahead. How do they kill their prey? I saw that. Um, so they're going to be ambush predators, kind of like we talked about. They're going to lunge out and grab their prey. And usually they're going to kill them by drowning. Then they'll do the death roll after the prey is dead and rip it up to pieces. Why do they seem to ignore wading birds? That's an excellent point. So alligators and wading birds kind of have this weird relationship. So wading birds actually prefer to build their nests atop um, alligator habitats because it's wonderful protection from things crawling up the tree and eating the chicks and the eggs. Now, granted, every once in a while, an alligator gets a nice little snack from a chick that happens to fall out of the nest. But if you think about it, if that chick would have fallen on the ground and there's no alligator there, it still wouldn't have survived. So everyone's a little bit of a winner. The wading birds and the nesting birds um, are going to have a nice protected nest, and the alligator gets the occasional snack. 
what was the first alligator you ever held? Um, What's his name? Archie, yeah, his name was Archie. He was about this long. Um, he was adorable and I've been hooked ever since. Do stripes indicate the age? Yes, they do. So they lose their stripes at about maybe six, seven years old. Um, and they, they lose them because they no longer need them to camouflage um, from the predators that they have when they are younger. How can I estimate their length or age? There's actually, um, completely blanking on this, but there's a way to figure it out. If you look at their, the length of their head, you can actually estimate the length of their entire body based on the size of their head. I'm blanking on the proportion right now, but definitely look that up um, after this is over. Um, so you can kind of see there. And usually age does correlate roughly to um, maturity uh, as well. Are there alligator only aquariums? Um, not that I'm aware of. There is a St. Augustine alligator farm, which is the only place in the world to have all 24 species of crocodilians. That's a cool place to check out, um, but they have other stuff as well. Let's see. They seem to move every night during mating and ups sometimes in weird places. Um, they seem to move around at night during mating, ending up sometimes in weird places, garage porches. Do they get disoriented? I'm not quite sure. Um, perhaps at night they get riled up and, you know, you know, not aware of their surroundings. Um, and they do get a little more kind of frisky and territorial during mating season. Um, but I'm not sure the level of how they get disoriented. Um, but I think that's about all of them. And I will pass it back over to Aaron to take us out. All right, if you guys are interested in learning more about our alligator research, I put a link in the chat um, to learn more about that. So check that out. Um, lastly, I wanna thank our friends of the aquarium who are watching as your support has allowed us to get new filming equipment and otherwise supports the education work that we do. If you're interested in becoming a friend, more information is provided with the link on the screen um, that will also be put in the chat in a few minutes. Um, and then next slide, there's a few events that are upcoming. So we have our Super Museum Sunday, um, the Burfish and Buddies, Sing Fly Soar on World Migratory Bird Day, and Drought Tolerant Coastal Landscapes for Water Conservation. Um, all these events are free, but we recommend uh, pre-registering for them, and you can do so at gacoast.uga.edu slash events. Um, and then our next slide has a few of our social media links that uh, is a good way to stay connected with all that we are doing. Um, so yeah, thank you for coming to the program. I'm gonna turn it over to Isaac for his last goodbyes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to tune back in. Thank you all so much for coming out. Y'all had excellent questions. Thanks for being an amazing audience. Uh, look out for uh, your own activity sheet. I make these cute little guys just like this. And I remember to be good neighbors to our alligators. Bye, everyone.